Up next will be uh, Doug Struble, who's just, I guess, down the street from Jason Gazelle. <laughs> so, <laughs> and just down the street from, uh, from Chuck Ayub, who's been watching the program tonight. So, uh, uh, Doug, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll let you have the, uh, the stage here. Yeah. So you can see my screen? See your screen. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I basically want to talk about astrophotography when it comes to a major, you know, red, white zone, what have you. Um, so, first of all, um, I'm working on two projects right now. One is Sharpless 224, which is a uh, planetary nebula, which I'm doing in hydrogen and oxygen. And then the other one I'm working on right now is uh, ABLE 30, which is uh, a small planetary nebula. Uh, and that one is mostly in, in mostly in oxygen. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to doing astrophotography. Can you hear me okay? Are you just fine? Yep. Okay. So, um, one of the biggest things is people think that you need to be in a dark area to do astrophotography and that's not true at all it used to be maybe back in the 90s or 80s and before um but with the capabilities of doing narrow narrow band astrophotography um you could do a lot more within the city limits um like chuck i'm uh 15 minutes from the detroit area and um, back in 2016, I, I uh, well, I guess I've always wanted to do astrophotography all my life. I've loved astronomy as a kid, but I knew to do it right and to do it where I was at would require, you know, amount of investment and patience. And, and, and uh, back in 2016, a... Um, a drunk driver told my car in my driveway mm. it was a performance challenger and i got a payout settlement for like over twenty thousand uh which i started you know thinking to myself well if i'm gonna get into astrophotography i got a, a good substantial investment to do it now and so i i made my initial investment and then once i started getting into it i realized that patience is the number one investment needed to do astrophotography within city limits. So I started building an observatory. It's just a slide off roof. It's nothing too crazy. Um, but I started building it in my backyard. And um, as a result, I have two rigs running. Uh, my primary rig is a 165 millimeter um, Explore Scientific uh, APO. And then I have a stellar view, uh, 102 millimeter on my second rig. And then I have two laptops uh, that control each one uh, that I monitor from inside my house using TeamViewer um, in my studio. Wow. And the dog uh, guards your equipment? Uh, they're huskies. They don't make for very good dark guard dogs. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, they're uh, they're kind of funny that way. So, yeah, these these are my two main rigs right here. Um, yeah. I, I have my Explorer Scientific sitting on a, a uh, astrophysics Mach One. Wow, beautiful. Yeah, and uh, the focal length is around twelve, or it's actually eleven fifty six millimeters, which is which does me pretty well. Um, I like to get a little bit more focal length, uh, maybe a bigger even bigger APO some down, down the road. Uh, but for the time being, um, it does really well. Um, so getting back to doing astrophotography in a uh, light polluted area, being 15 minutes from Detroit, just like Chuck is. And then um, uh, Jason, who just talked before me, he's uh, about maybe 45 minutes from me um, and Jason has actually been a, a wealth of information. I had to uh, I had to do some soul searching and, and digging 
when it came to doing astrophotography, but um, even broadband can be done um, in this area as well too. This is my M1, M51 I did a couple of years ago. Um, but if you were to look at w what it took to do that, um, I had 50 hours involved. Uh, so when you're doing astrophotography in a major light polluted area, you got to really pile on the integration time in order to pull that signal out above the noise floor. Um, and that's kind of what I do. So like, it's like one of those things like, you know, a watch pot never boils. That's kind of what I have to do here. So a, a lot of the time when I have my, um, my rigs going, um, I'm working on actual work myself. I'm independently employed. I, I, I produce advertising production to TV commercials, stuff like that. Um, so I'll work on that kind of stuff while it's kind of going, you know, in the background. Um, and then, you know, um, when you really pile on those hours, you can get that, that signal to really pop up through the noise. Uh, but for the most part, I do a lot of broadband stuff. Uh, this is the latest image I just did recently of the M1 Crab Nebula. Um, and as you can see, there is a, a part of uh, oxygen being ejected from the core, uh, which is not really picked up in broadband a lot. So it gives me some capabilities of doing some things that maybe aren't often captured in a certain type of palette. Um, I, I, I tend to do a lot of hydrogen alpha and oxygen pallets with, and then I'll include like, you know, some RGB stars uh, to give it some color uh, in there as well. Um, I, I don't know, this is the first time presenting. I, I'm not really sure how you take questions, but I would really love to help people out that are living in a heavy light, light polluted area yeah. uh, to give them some direction on what could really help them uh, produce you know some really nice images um and uh you know I, I guess when it comes to broadband i do really short exposures like around 60 seconds a piece uh at zero gain um otherwise the the histogram uh tends to move far to the right and you tend to overwhelm the uh the, the camera sensor itself so uh I do really sort of short exposures. Even with narrowband, I tend to do only two minute exposures with 200 gain. So it really eats up a lot of hard drive space, but you know, it, uh, it really helps, you know, compiling the data together, uh, bringing out the signal. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately I'm able to produce some really, some really cool things. Uh, that can't normally be done around this area. Right. I had a question. I had a question, Doug, about your uh, strategy for storage. Do you do you get rid of your raw data after a while? I mean, or do you just keep buying hard drives to store your raw data? So I have a NAS unit. It's a forty-eight terabyte uh, network attack storage. That's yeah, that's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Well, I'm I'm fortunate enough where I can write it off because. I own a production company, advertising production company too. So I use that for both work and astrophotography. Um, so I have, I have two, um, I have two Mac desktops. One is a newer one that just came out last year. It's a 16 um, core system. And then my other one's a 12 core system from a few years ago. And I run both of them a lot to uh, process the data. And they're both attached um, via 10 gigabit switch uh, to a, a NAS uh, network drive. Yeah, beautiful. I have a question too. Have you ever used, being that you're in advertising media, um, have you ever used any of your astrophotography in your advertising programs? I have not. I have not found a purpose for it, uh, specifically for that, no. Um, I've been featured in a lot of magazines, uh, BBC Sky at Night, Sky and Telescope, Astronomy Magazine, 
uh, APOD and, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of this meeting, what I actually do for a living, there's been no crossover. I see. Aside from the aside from the equipment, you know. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And and out of all the images that you've made, I mean, uh, what do you, what do you consider to be like your top three? Um, this one was one of my favorite, the Flaming Skull Planetary Nebula. Um, I think I had probably around, yeah, it's 36.4 hours between hydrogen alpha and oxygen. Um, but one of my favorite ones I did was, uh, where is it at here? Um, this one is part of a, this is part of a super giant or a supernova giant, uh, Sharpless 96. And, um, I did this one um, probably about a year ago. Yeah, look at that. Um, like lace work, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. Or gauze, it's, it's incredible. Um, I, I think you know. I have a lot. I have a lot more. Um, I guess success when it comes to APOs, uh, mm -hmm. refractors. Um, I, I've had a, a ten inch. Uh, RC, I've had a Smith cast grain. Um, I've had a 12-inch newt. Um, I have a lot of reflectivity problems because of the light pollution here. Um, once I get below 40 degrees, um, it, it starts to overwhelm the telescope. Um, and I don't have that problem with APOs as much. Um, so I, I tend to use a lot of refractors uh, more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, one of my favorite ones I did was, it's, uh, where's that? This one right here. It's a uh, Wolf Ryan, uh, WR-134. Yeah. And, um, this one is not really captured that often with the full disc, circular disc of the auction data. Um, and so... I really try to pile it on, That's you know, good. With that. Um, I guess with that, I mean, I would like to take some questions. I don't know if there's any questions about people who are having a hard time uh, with a light polluted area. Yeah, we, I don't, I don't see any questions yet in the chat, but um, uh, what is, uh, obviously this is going to get the gears turning uh, with people. Uh, uh, you know, I agree with you about, um, you know, that uh, you can do amazing. I mean, obviously you can do amazing stuff, even in a light polluted sky. Uh, uh, Jerry Hubble and I have had uh, a lot of programs uh, and Kent Martz and I as well, where we, we talk to the audience about uh, trying to do as much astronomy as they can from their own backyards, you know, uh, because yeah. it's, 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 it's time in, you know, that makes you the better astronomer. And if you're waiting to go to a really dark site or, you, or, you know, you're waiting for conditions to be perfect or these kinds of things, uh, you don't get as much time in uh, uh, to, you know, get the experience level that you need uh, to make, you know, what Jerry Hubble and I talk about making the equipment disappear, you know, because you want to have it all working so well that you don't really have to th think about the gear too much, you know, and so, um, and you can concentrate on gathering the data and doing all the rest of it uh, that you need to do to do amazing work like you're doing. So um, I, uh, you know, I'm stunned uh, by, by the quality of your work and, uh, um, you know, always love uh, seeing um, images come from you. Recently, you showed us a crab nebula shot that was like, 31 hours and change uh, also an amazing image so yeah I mean I think the biggest thing you know to take away when it comes to doing astrophotography with the light polluted area is that um, uh, when it comes to obviously narrow bands you know it's going to be easier to do um, it levels the playing field um, when you get into narrow band the band pass, 
you know, of each narrow band filter, you know, like a, a seven or six is really good for hydrogen, alpha and sulfur. But when it comes to oxygen, um, you really need a shorter band pass, like around three NM uh, to do oxygen because of the light pollution, how it affects oxygen, uh, especially with the moon. So like with the moon, I can go up to about 80% of the moon mm -hmm. within 30 degrees of the moon at 80% and still have good, good data, you know, good signal to ratio, uh, good signal to noise ratio anyways. Um, and, um, that's kind of like a rule of thumb for me. So, um, uh, my oxygen filters I use on both rigs are Astrodon 3 nm And I realized that, you know, Astrodon, you know, they got sold off and they're not really doing well, you know. Uh, I think Chroma might offer a 3 nm filter, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so, so on both rigs. Thank you. I have the three nanometer hydrogen and oxygen filters from Chroma. And um, on my Schmidt Cassegrain at F6.3, so far they've worked really well. Um, I haven't tried them at F5 yet, but I expect that they'll work well at F5 as well. Um, yeah, it's been really good so far. Is there a reason why you went to three nm on HA and, and sulfur? I live north of San Francisco. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I mean, like, I'm 15. The narrower, the better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. I, I'm 15 minutes from Detroit. So I'm in a Boro oh, yeah. Sky scale of eight. Um, I'm in a white zone. Yeah. And I, I find six to seven to be fine with HA and sulfur. Okay. I haven't had a problem. Uh, nice. But oxygen is the major problem for me. And that's where I use the three NM filters for those. Okay. Yeah, and the, um, uh, for Chroma, the five nanometer and the three nanometer filters are the same price. So I just went ahead and dropped the three nanometer. Uh, how, much so did, the, how much did you charge for those? Um, they were cheaper than Astrodons, but more expensive than all the other ones. I can't remember. Okay. I, look. I bought them like a year ago. <laughs> they just, okay. they, you know, they just doubled their prices on everything, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Me, me, and Jason were just talking about that the other day. It's terrible. Is that the fault of some really amazing astrophotographers driving the prices up? <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. But uh, yeah. Well, since, since I don't use um, like Hyperstar and stuff like that, um, uh, there wasn't any reason for me to go any wider than three. Because uh, if uh, it, you probably know know this, but for everybody else out there, if you have a fast imaging system like a, an F2 camera lens, or if you're using Hyperstar or RASA at F2, really narrow narrowband filters can actually put you off band in those really fast systems. Yeah, um, that's what I've heard. Yeah, so I, um, I, so like three nanometers wouldn't be good for those systems, but I don't, I, um, I don't tend to image on, on really fast focal ratios. So uh, the three nanometer is just gonna work well for me. But I do have also the Optolong LX Stream uh, Duo narrowband filter. And that one's, I think, five nanometers in H alpha and seven in oxygen um, to, to grab all those oxygen lines there. Uh, are, you, are you using that on a DSLR? I'm using that on the ZWO294 color camera. So yeah, I'm using that on, on color. Okay, yeah, I've, I've heard great things about that filter. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I hit my first data set with it on the Rosette Nebula is ready to process. So I'm going to be processing that very shortly here. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I've heard is the oxygen ratio seems to be pretty low, but that's normal for the universe. So that's not really a matter of the filter itself. It's a matter of, you know, just True. oxygen ratio. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to see what I need to end up doing to the image to, to get the colors to balance in a pleasing way. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it turns out. The, the subframes uh, on the rosette so far look really promising. They've got a nice uh, spread of red, green, and blue. And green, the green and the blue are like right on top of each other. So I think they did a good job with the design of, of this filter going over the different color channels on the Bayer matrix and stuff. So uh, oh, look good. See how it turns out. Yeah, with this, with this particular image, I did 21 hours of oxygen. And I only did around seven hours of hydrogen. So this this object seems to look very oxygen centric um but it was important to me to, to pull out that little tail 
uh, of ejected matter that's coming out from the core. Um, so yeah, that, that is extremely cool. I'd, I'd have to go double check and see if I picked that up in my oxygen data. I did notice in the Crab Nebula, because I also did it in, in HOO recently, that the oxygen signal does seem stronger for the same exposure time, um, which was really interesting to see. Uh, I'll have to go back and look for that stream. That's really cool. I've not seen that very often. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, I've only seen it a few times. Um, and that's what I was really curious about. Um, going after broadband or a narrow band uh, is something that I can do, you know, relatively more easily here than than broadband, of course. Um, like in this particular one right here, this is uh, able 72, which is more more oxygen based. And actually, it's almost all oxygen based. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah, and uh, it's pretty small. Um, so when it comes to some of these smaller um, nebulas, I, I tend to uh, I tend to uh, remove all the stars using Starnet, and then I use Topaz Denoise uh, to help sharpen up the object itself. But I do it within each channel before I bring it into Photoshop. So I do all my pre-processing first in PixInsight. And then I uh, go through Photoshop for the, the final processing. Yeah, I've heard, I know a lot of people who, who do it that way. Uh, I never really got good at Photoshop, <coughs> so I just do everything in PixInsight. But uh, yeah, I've seen people get some incredible results by kind of mixing the two pieces of software. But I've not gotten rid of my Photoshop subscription. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's interesting. Like, I guess when I first learned PixInsight, I. Um, I wanted to see how much I could do in PixInsight. And then, you know, it has such a huge learning curve. And then I found myself backtracking back to Photoshop after pre-processing. So like I'll do pre-processing in PixInsight. I'll do some, you know, uh, dynamic background extraction. I'll do, you know, some typical things. But for the most part, um, I'm, uh, you know, processing each channel independently in Photoshop and then I'll, I'll bring them in there uh, for the most part. Great. Wonderful. Doug, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing and coming on tonight. I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time, uh, but, um, you know, and I hope we can get you on again. You have a lot yeah. to share here. That's great. Yeah, I love to. I, I love to help out people where I can. Um, you know, like I said, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, doing astrophotography in a heavy light polluted area. Um, I, I wish I would have had something more, you know, I guess, dynamic, you know, presentation to show, but. Um, yeah, just mind blowing images. I mean, I, I don't know how much better it can really get. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, uh, if anybody wants to contact me, um, astrophotography by Douglas J. Struble on Facebook. And then I have an Astrobin account, you know, for. Uh, yeah. What, what is the sure. best? What is, is the Facebook account itself the best one to uh, reach you, you think? Either one's fine. Um, you know, Astrobin or on Facebook. Those are my two main things. I, I use Astrobin as a repository so I can go back and look at my integration time I spent on things. Well, Astrobin's a great, great uh, resource too. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, let me see if I can just find your astrophotography by Douglas J. Struble on Facebook. I'll go ahead and pick, post that and share it in the chat. Okay, there you go. And, um, and then we've got... I went and checked the chroma filters for 750 a piece when I bought them. I have to go look. Ouch, oh letter. my God, that's expensive. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, uh, if you're gonna spend money on on other good components, uh, having good filters will let you actually take advantage of them <laughs> and when you're in light polluted areas. No. But that's that's what I spent my my stimulus money on. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I agree. I mean, I I think I spent four hundred and fifty dollars per filter on Astrobin, or on uh, Astrodon filters, uh, two two or three years ago. Um, so it's amazing how much they come up in price. 
And, that, and that's for the, the, the price I mentioned was for the two inch size, because uh, I wanted to. to oh, two inch, okay. Yeah, yeah got for the two it. inch yeah. size. Because I, want, I wanted a future proof, because right now I don't have a large format camera, but the odds are pretty good at some point that I will. Um, so I figured I'd go ahead and get them now, as opposed to buying one and a quarter inch ones, and then later buying two inch ones. <laughs> No, that makes sense. Yeah, I've been thinking about doing the same. And the next set of filters I'm going to do is a two-inch filter set, just in case I decided to upgrade down the road too. And I know uh, Jason uh, has been looking into two-inch filters too. He just spoke before me. We're pretty good friends, live in the same area, um, and for the same reason. I, I think he just bought a new uh, Zoo APC. Uh, uh asp size camera sensor so um yeah awesome awesome 